And every single one of these seminars and workshops, they're like a family reunion. Because there's a lot of us that always come together and we always have this party in the spirit. And for me, it's so exciting to see the journey that everybody's gone on. Because every time we get together again, I see the next step that you take and that you have taken since we last met. And um, you'll see how hard it is to say goodbye when everybody leaves. And when you see each other again, and I promise you, there are faces here you will see again. As we meet, we don't know when we will meet or where we will meet. It could be in the States. It could be in South Africa. It could be in Europe. I don't know. But when we do, we'll all see what God has done with us in this time. And I think that's what I love about this process the most is that it is a process. You go from glory to glory. And I think it's only someone who was called to this level of ministry that understands that. You know, when I was young and first got on fire for the Lord and wanted to do the work of the ministry, I wanted everything to happen tomorrow. Everything was, I had to do everything today because the world was going to change tomorrow. You remember those days? <laughs> and then the Lord uh, tempers you a little bit. And you realize, no, you actually don't need a daily plan. You need a yearly plan. You realize that the Lord moves in times and in seasons. And that all we need to do is remain obedient. And as you take those steps in His time and in His season, you see the doors open. You see the land shift. You see Him do what you couldn't do. And again, I want to remind you that it's your part to be obedient, but it's his part to make you into the vessel you need to be. You cannot shape yourself. You cannot make yourself into an apostle. You cannot make yourself into a prophet. You cannot call yourself. You cannot empower yourself. This is a calling from the Most High God. And he who has called you will complete. He will equip. He will shape. He will bring you to the cross. You cannot even crucify yourself. All you can do is recognize the nails and give up the ghost. Our place is to submit, obey, and serve. And when we do these things for the Lord, He equips, He empowers, and He releases us to do the things that we need to do. And I want to bring each one of you to rest this evening. As we continue with the grand finale, I first want to bring you to rest because you're trying so hard to do the work of God. <clears throat> to find your call, to get the answers, to be the apostle, to be the prophet, to be the teacher, the evangelist, pastor, wh whatever it is, you're trying so hard. Did you start in grace and end in works? Hmm? Did you forget why you're on this road? The greatest challenge that I have for you is the SOS. But the rest is really up to the Holy Spirit, and we forget that sometimes. I forget that sometimes. You, you get so busy training your mighty men. You get so busy identifying them and applying all the principles. You get so hung up on the principles <laughs> that you forget why you're here. And at the end of the day, when all the principles are gone and all your strength is gone and you've got nothing left, that's when you realize that it's really the hand of God that puts you here. And it's the hand of God that will keep you here. And we have to trust Him to do what we cannot do. We have to trust Him in spite of our sin, in spite of our failure, in spite of our pushing through, in spite of everything, in spite of what people say, in spite of the teams that let us down, in spite of the mistakes we've made. We have to trust God more than then we trust ourselves, then we trust our weakness, then we trust others to let us down. We have to trust God more. This is not about the title or the position. This is about doing what we were put on this earth to do. And although I'm speaking on the apostle, I hope at the same time I'm tearing away the title of the apostle because it's not about the position but about the work 
that God has called us to do. And it is time for us to put our hand to the plow. It is time to count the cost. It is time to look at the building materials and see how much it will cost us to build this magnificent temple, this city on a hill that God has called us all to build. It is time to stop playing around with what I want and what I feel and about my ministry and what I think. And it's time we start doing and building and establishing God's will in the earth. Now, if I have to do that as somebody who has no title, as a little pawn on the chessboard, then I'm going to be a pawn on the chessboard. I don't have to be the bishop or the knight or the king or the queen as long as I am in the hand of God. As long as I am in His will, is there anything else? Is there anything else I would rather be? Hmm? I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord. I would rather be a nothing and know that I'm in His will and that I'm the most anointed doorkeeper that there is empowered to keep that door than a king upon His throne knowing that that's not what God called me to be. Every single one of us have a part to play. We have a position ordained by God, not ordained by man. And yes, as leaders, God needs us to help others recognize that ordination in their lives. That's certainly a big part of what the apostle does. But this evening, as we come to look at the apostolic function. I want to lay the weight of the church on your shoulders, apostles. I want you to feel the responsibility of the title. I want you to bear the care of the church upon you. And I want you to feel the intensity of it, of what we're called to do. That it's no longer about what is my calling, what is my vision, what is my place. But Lord, whatever my hand finds to do today, may I indeed do it with every breath that is in me. Let us run this race that is set before us. Let us lay aside every weight and sin that so easily besets us, that we might run with endurance. Every one of us has a different race. Every one of us looks before us today with a task at hand. Now, you're never going to complete the task at hand tomorrow if you don't deal with the task at hand today. If all you are aiming for is finally one day reaching your mandate, finally one day reaching your vision, doing that one great thing one day, you will miss what God has called you to do today. Can I bring you to contentment? Can I bring you to peace? What if all God needs you to do is to sit at His feet and worship Him? What if that's all he requires of you. What if you've gone through all the death, all the suffering, all the rejection to do nothing but to tell him I love you because I was born as a vessel to worship you. Adam and Eve fellowship with the father in the garden of Eden. Did you know what their calling was? To fellowship with God and to take care of the garden. So simple. Our first ministry is to the Father. And we so easily forget that. And yes, this evening we're going to look at a bunch of fantastic, juicy principles. And then get your mind ticking and your spirit soaring and reminding you why you're here. But before I go there, might I just bring you back to the child in you that was called so long ago in your foolishness, in your weakness, in your selfish ambition. And that God saw through all of that and determined that you would be called a mighty warrior, a king, a queen of the most high God. Can we please go back to why we stand here today? 
before we put all the stripes on our shoulders and the badges across our chests and wear all our medallions to prove to the world why we're so magnificent. Can we go back to the seed of the apostleship within us, this heart that beats for something new, willing to pay the price to change not just the church, but our communities, our nations. Feel the weight of that. And remember that you're never going to be able to carry that weight with all your talent, skill, ability, and principle. Because God didn't call the big, strong gladiator. He called the shepherd boy with nothing but a sling and a stone to take down Goliath. This evening, as we look at the apostolic function, I want to ask you, how do you know when you're doing your job? When it comes to the ministry of the apostle, some people say I'm an apostle, some people say I'm apostolic, some say I'm doing an apostolic work, and all, in all of that, we're all trying to figure out what is an apostle supposed to do exactly? And as an apostle, how do I know if I've done my job? Well, that is the crux of what we're going to be looking at this evening. And how can um, you begin to tell me if you've done your job, if you don't know what your job is? Hmm. It's like that in the workplace. How can your boss come and say, you've done a fantastic job if you don't have a job description? What are you called to do? And so we're going to look at two aspects this evening. We're going to look at your mandate, and we're going to look at your purpose in fulfilling that mandate. How you know if you're on track. And looking a little broader, how do we know when an apostle has done the work he's meant to be doing in the church? How do we identify not just the character of the apostle? Because I've spoken about that before. I've, I've given you a picture of what an apostle looks like in my other teachings. But I want to go a little deeper. And I want to say, what is he supposed to be doing? What is his function? When all is said and done, can you tick off the list that says, I've done it. Good and faithful servant. You have completed what I've given you to do. But like, you know, in all things, we kind of need to start at the beginning. And we need to ask ourselves, okay, what is our job in the first place to know if we have fulfilled its requirements? And so I'm going to look at six apostolic mandates this evening. And as I share each one of these from the Word, you're going to begin to see the different places that God has taken you. If you're an apostle or feel that you may be an apostle, perhaps you can already begin to identify some of these patterns in your life. Now, taking the dictionary definition of mandate, any contract by which a person undertakes to perform service for another. Pattern, commission, these are words we can look up in the word. The purpose of why you've been put in this earth. An apostle has a mandate. A prophet has a mandate. The end goal, the thing that you were born to do. And I'm going to look at six different types specifically. And there's some things I want you to recognize. And think for yourself as I go through each of these. Because I'm not going to give you all the answers. You're apostles. I'm giving you the highlights, the main points. And I want you to think about them, flesh them out, and allow the Holy Spirit to give you further revelation. But I want you to recognize these specific points and really think it through. Each of these mandates are going to require different kinds of trainings. Because of the nature of each of them, and as I go through, you'll get it, you're going to require a different kind of training. And perhaps as I go through, you might suddenly understand why the Lord suddenly shifted you here and shifted you there to suddenly establish in you some character traits or even spiritual gifts that you didn't have before. The trainings are going to be different. A different price is also required. Have you ever asked yourself, well, how come I have to pay this price? How come that guy doesn't have to pay this price? I mean, certainly we see that with um, everybody else in the church, but even from apostle to apostle. You know, you look at other apostles who, who have the same call, and you're like, but 
How come they didn't have to give that up? I can imagine that's how Paul must have felt when he said, well, hey guys, what's the deal? You know, Peter gets to, to have a, a wife with him. The other apostles get to travel, but us, what are we? You know, we're just nobodies. They can do what we can't do. And it's, I mean, I don't think any of us who have an apostolic call has not been there. It's like, really, Lord, it's not fair. How come I have to pay this price and they don't have to pay that price? Because they're paying a price of their own. And they're saying the exact same thing about you. Because every mandate is different and a different price is required for each. Each requires a different character. Have you recognized the shaping of your character as a person? Some people might want to call it a paradigm shift. I call it character training. Where the Lord will make you from one person into the next and it is miraculous. Nothing you could have done with your own strength. Now, there's something else you need to do. Realize, you can fulfill more than one mandate. In other words, you can complete a mandate and then move on to another. It is indeed progressive. And here's something else you need to keep in mind. This is a commission by God. You do not choose your mandate. Your mandate chooses you. And as I go through each of these, perhaps you'll say, ooh, being a David sounds kind of nice. I wish I was a David. Well, tough. Tough because God called you to be a Moses. So what are you going to do about it? Well, I want to be a Moses like him. I want to be a David. I want to be this. I want to be that. Oh, I wish I was that. Sorry, guys, there's some things that are written in stone. And this is one of those things. God is the one. The Father is the one who called. Jesus set in the church the apostles, the prophets, and the rest of the fivefold ministry. He's the one that calls, commissions, and releases you. You do not pick this for yourself. You were born for this. You were created for this. Even as Apostle Paul said that he was called in his mother's womb. So when you get that memo, firstly you can just let all the rest go, and you can also come to peace, realizing God's got this. God's always had this. You don't need to panic that you're going to lose your calling. How can you lose something you never had? If you're trying to hold on to something that's not your call, how can you lose something you never held in your hand? And if you do hold it in your hand, you can rest assured God himself put it in your hand. And Satan cannot snatch it from you. Come to peace. We, we keep thinking we're going to miss God. Going to miss God. I'm not going to fulfill my call. Going to miss God. I'm, I'm not going to do what he's told me to do. And then I, I'm not going to, I'm going to lose my calling. Because you were literally born for this. You were born for this. You were created for this. Your spiritual and physical DNA was shaped for this. If you don't have the calling, it means you weren't born for it. God has already given you everything you need. Come to peace. And let's get on with business. And discover what your calling is so that you may begin walking it out. So let's look at these apostolic mandates. And I'm going to use some New Testament examples and some Old Testament types side by side, okay? Now I've done teaching on each of these types separately. But I want to look more, not so much at the types, but as the mandates that they fulfill. And the first one are, is our patriarchal, spiritual parent mandate. And some fantastic examples of this are Peter, Paul in the New Testament, and in the Old Testament, Abraham and Sarah. Now, spiritual parenting is something that is becoming very popular in the church right now. God is reviving spiritual mothers and fathers to reparent the flock. We, we have a generation of orphans, of broken men and women in the church from the way society's been, the way we've gone, we have a lot of brokenness in the church and God is raising up Abrahams and Sarahs to raise up these broken orphans, to equip them and send them out again. And I'm gonna read a passage here that defines Abraham and God's promise to him. And I want you to see the price that he paid to fulfill that call. Because I remember I said, I want you to keep in mind the different trainings, the price each one pays, and the kind of training that they go through. Genesis 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and 
from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those that bless you and I will curse him who curses you. And all the families of the earth will be blessed. I love the blessing part. But so many skim over the first little verse there, don't they? Abraham paid quite a price to fulfill this mandate. And what we're looking here is an apostle who's called to be a spiritual father, a patriarch, somebody who starts something new, one who originates a new tribe. We talk a lot about tribes. Somebody who begins a whole new spiritual DNA, if you will. Now, I need you to realize something. Not every apostle is the same. I'm talking about six types just for now, and I'm sure that there are more. Perhaps you have had a revelation of some. For me, these are the six that I've personally lived, that the Lord showed us that we've gone through, so I'm sharing them with you. And one of the first is that of a spiritual parent. Now, not every apostle is called to be an Abraham. Get the memo. Get the memo, guys, because you've got these rising up in the kingdom of God right now, true apostles of God, and you're expecting them to be something that they will never be. You wanted them to be a spiritual father, but they were never meant to be one. And you're putting this expectation and getting disappointed when they don't pay up. Or if God has not called you to be a spiritual father, you're trying to be something you're not. And it's discouraging for both sides. So let's really identify your mandate. And let's focus just on that. Like I said, God can shift you when you complete one mandate. He can take you to another. But let's look at where you're at right now. Now, a spiritual father is one that raises up spiritual sons. That's why Peter and Paul are fantastic examples of this as well. Especially Paul, who raised up Timothy and Silas. We've got Titus in there. He was one who didn't just teach the word, but one that raised up sons who continued the work long after he left. A lot of the other disciples did not do this. They had different mandates. I think Peter had John Mark, from what we can see in the scriptures. All of the others, John, I believe, had a disciple that continued. You've got old Polycarp in there. It was a couple of generations down, but that's church history. But from what we can read in the Word, there were very few of them that were fathers. You know, we just assume an apostle is a spiritual father, but it's not true. It may not be your mandate. So if you're not such a spiritual father, huh? Take a deep breath. Maybe God's not calling you to be one, and it's okay. There are a couple of other types that perhaps you can identify with. Not every apostle is called to be a spiritual parent. Let it go. However, if that is something that's been burning in you and something God's been doing in your life, it's time to begin looking at it and realize that God is calling you to establish a new family. But make no mistake. It comes with one of the highest prices of all the apostolic types. What does it mean to start a new spiritual DNA? Oh, that lay in verse 1, didn't it? Get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I'll show you. In other words, go to who knows where. And leave everything you know, everyone you know, every spiritual DNA you had, everything you received, everything, every archetype, the food you ate, the people you know. Leave that country completely and become someone completely new. If God is calling you to be a spiritual father, you don't get to stay at home. You don't get to keep what's familiar. You don't get to keep your nation and your archetype and your family. So if God has called you to be an Abraham, make no mistake, there's a price that comes with it. But not everyone is called to be an Abraham. And we make this mistake of imposing our mandates on others. Just because God asked you to give up your country doesn't mean that every apostle is asked to give up their country. Some may just to be give up their state. Maybe they just have to move within country. I don't know. There's certainly a lot of shifting around. When God calls you to be an apostle, I promise you don't get comfortable. There will be a shifting. You will be changed. But not everybody is called to the same dramatic shift as Abraham was or as Paul was, who was sent from the Pharisees to the Gentiles. Complete, complete shift. Peter didn't have to pay that. 
So realize a different mandate requires a different price. Now we have mandate number two. And I call this apostle the pattern maker. I had this, um, this very incorrect notion. I thought that all apostles should be pattern makers. And when somebody didn't know how to make a pattern, I said, well, then you couldn't be much of an apostle. I didn't realize there was more to being an apostle mm -hmm. <laughs> than just someone who evangelized and made patterns. This is just one type of apostle. And I think you're going to know pretty clearly who the New Testament example and the Old Testament type is. And we look again at Apostle Paul, but our Old Testament type, there's no better one than Moses. The ultimate pattern maker, right? Exodus 24, verse 9. According to all that I show you, that is, the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings, just so you shall make it. Moses, I'm going to give you the pattern for the tabernacle, for the furnishings, for everything, but just so. You will make it. You will make it exactly to spec. You are not going to add an extra ring where a ring shouldn't be or a cubit where a cubit shouldn't be. It will be exactly as I tell you to do it. And for one who is a pattern maker, they have this kind of attention to detail. It should be just so. They're annoying. They're fussy. They're picky. They're detail-oriented. It has to be just so. Well, what did you expect? They're pattern makers. So what kind of training do you think a pattern maker would have to go through? For somebody like me, a lot of it. Because I am not analytical, and I don't like thinking about details. I just want to run and do and hop and skip and jump and pick up my sword and fight bad guys. That's me. Becoming a pattern maker was the hardest, hardest season of my life because I had to do something I'd never done before. I had to think. <laughs> In detail. And put the pieces together as God gave it to me. Not everyone can get the pattern. And even as I go through each of these mandates, I want you to already start seeing how possible it is for apostles to work together. Because not everybody can be a spiritual parent, and not everybody could be a pattern maker, but you could certainly work together towards the same goal, couldn't you? Absolutely, because you're going to have different functions in the church. The goal's the same, but how you walk it out is going to be different by apostle. And you can start seeing how it is possible to bring unity in the body of Christ. How each of the apostles, even in the Old Testament, you, I mean New Testament, sorry, you saw how they had their own mandate. But you see how they did join together. You see how Timothy and Silas and Peter, I mean Paul, got together and they could work even as apostles together as one. It is possible. I know that right now we're not seeing it. The only way we really see apostles working together in today's day and age is um, in ministry association. You know, I rub shoulders with you, you rub shoulders. I know apostle so-and-so, and yes, my good friend, apostle so-and-so, and we're all so jolly good. My good friend and my good buddy so that I can bolster my ego and sound really good. That's the really only way we see apostles working together today. But a time is coming, a change is coming to the church, where God is calling his apostles to work together to build the end times church. We can't do it alone. Each of us have different mandates. Each of us have different visions. But if we bring it all together, we'll get the full picture. No one apostle has the full picture. Even in the New Testament, not one had the full picture. And even in the Old Testament, although Moses got a large part of it, we see how the judges come along and the kings come along. And God even adds to that. Not even Moses had the fullness of understanding. God added to it through the years. And it's the same with us. You can't be a solo player here. It's time that we recognize each of our places and acknowledge the places of others and have a little bit of humility and readiness to listen, to serve one another in love. This is, guys, this is something we don't see in the church. Can we change it here in our hearts? 
Can we take the first step forward in the right direction? Can we build those patterns? And this is something you need to realize as well, is that just because you're a pattern maker doesn't mean that you get to build the pattern. Look at David. Hmm? He got the pattern for the temple, and he was so excited about it. And he was ready to build. And why did God say, no, you will not build it? His eyes never saw the glory of the temple of Solomon. Hmm? And we misunderstand that sometimes. God has called you to get the pattern. And oftentimes that means he needs someone else to build it. Because you need to continue seeking him for more patterns because you're a pattern maker. That means that more patterns are required for more works. If that is your mandate then God will always give you patterns, patterns for different things, different visions. It will evolve. Now, you, if you try and build as well as get the pattern, you're going to stretch yourself out way too thin. You can't do both at the same time. And even when Moses got the pattern, he did not build the tabernacle, guys. He got the pattern for it. But the Lord told him exactly who should be involved in the building of it. Others built it, but he went up the mountain again and again to get the pattern so that they could build. Each one of us have a place to belong. The pattern maker is one who does a new thing, creates a pattern and a way of doing things that we didn't know before. He's an originator. Now, not every apostle is an originator. And not every apostle needs to be one because that's only mandate number two. I used to lump all of these into one and then, then, then realize I fell short. I'm like, well, I guess I'm not an apostle after all. <laughs> no, we've got to realize that there's a lot of diversity in what God is doing in his church. Well, there was always diversity. If you look in the scriptures, you see the diversity from Genesis to Revelation. We just haven't taken time to really look at it, have we? And see how vital each part is. So the third apostolic type is what I like to call the trail blazer. In my opinion, the most fun of all the apostolic types. <laughs> and my New Testament example of this is Peter and the Old Testament type, Joshua. Exodus 17, 10. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and her went up to the top of the hill. So there's Moses. Yay. Go, boys. And where was Joshua? Hmm? Down in the trenches with the sword in his hand, taking the land for God's people. He was in battle. Moses didn't have to be in battle. He was the pattern maker. It was smart for him to stay up on the hill. He was getting a little old. I mean, he, he a little tired. I mean, the dude couldn't even keep his arms up the whole time. He needed an Aaron and her to keep his arms up. I think he, even it just made a bit of sense for him to stay safe on top of the mountain because had he been taken out, tell me who was going to finish the pattern. Because he got more than just the pattern for the tabernacle, remember? He got more than just the law and the precepts. He also got the pattern for how to divide the land between all the tribes. There was a lot of patterns that he got in his lifetime. It was a good idea that he didn't die. Not yet anyway. But there was somebody that needed to go and take the land, to blaze the trail, to go where angels feared to trade. Much like Apostle Peter. And I call him the trailblazer because, do you know, he was the first to step into a Gentile home and bring salvation to the Gentiles. He broke a barrier, a social barrier, a religious barrier that no one had ever broken before. He stepped into the unknown, the unexpected, and did what everybody thought was the worst thing to possibly do. He went and ate and fellowshiped and stepped into the home of a Gentile. 
and he broke the veil. He tore it right down the middle. And that is what the trailblazer is called to do, to go ahead, to have the courage, yeah, to go where angels fear to tread, with his sword held high, to break those barriers, to get in people's faces, to smash. They are the ones with the sharp edge, the foolishness, the ones that get in Jesus' face and say, Oh, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus has to say, get thee behind me, Satan. Because sometimes I can't tell the Satan driving me, my flesh driving me, or the Holy Spirit driving me. Because they're all just all over the place sometimes. What? A different character to Moses again. Here you've got Moses, he's the thinker. He's putting the pattern together. He's got patience because the Lord knows. He climbed up that mountain. How many times? You need patience. Hmm? And then you've got Joshua. So fiery, stayed in the presence of the Lord longer than Moses did. Everywhere you place your feet, I've given to you. Boldness, courage, stepped out, sword in hand. We need those trailblazers and we'll see them. They, they tend to be very evangelistic sometimes. They go into the worst places. Now, you can fulfill more than one mandate. But if you are the pattern maker, you need yourself at Joshua. You starting to see how the apostles begin to work together yet? And how you don't have to do it all yourself. That's the biggest mistake you can make is try and be it all yourself. I know I've been there. Guys, it's impossible. You can't stand at the top of the hill, get in the pattern like this, and then hop and jump down the hill, pick up a sword and fight the enemy at the same time. Well, what's it going to be? What's it going to be? What, you, what is it God's calling you to do? You know the job that needs to be done, but you can only do the job you are called to do and fulfill the mandate that God has put on your life. You can't fulfill the mandate somebody of somebody else's. And that is why we need one another. Because more often than not, God will send a Joshua, sometimes even ahead of you, you pattern makers, to go and break the hard ground, to go prepare the way, to upset people to unsettle the status quo so that you can come with the pattern so that they will be ready for the pattern when it's time. You see, had Joshua not taken the land, how could they have established the kingdom? We need the trailblazers. We need the Peters who had the courage to step in. And look at what happened. Had Peter not taken that step forward to the Gentiles and spiritually and physically unlocked with his key the realm of heaven for the Gentiles, where would Paul be today? Because you see, Paul was our pattern maker and he needed to bring that pattern to the church. Where would we be today had Peter not been obedient to the voice of God and the church to come and realize, aha, so salvation is for the Gentiles also. He broke barriers. He went where no one else had gone. And we need such trailblazers again. But what are we doing? Tying them down, telling them to behave, to be nice, quiet little girls and boys. Because the rest of us are pattern makers or spiritual parents and these trailblazers keep upsetting the status quo. That's their mandate. They're meant to break ground. They're the kind that will go into a territory. Maybe they'll even start a couple of churches, start something completely new, break the ground, and then leave. And you're thinking, what kind of person is that? Sounds like a Joshua to me. Sounds like a trailblazer, someone that goes ahead. We just need another apostle to follow that work up with a pattern so that something can truly be built. These are men of war. And as, because of the nature of this mandate, this apostolic mandate is going to include a lot of spiritual warfare. You'll be doing warfare at the highest level. There will be backlashes. There will be demon manifestations. There will be nasty words. There will be words spoken against you. This is not an easy mandate, but it really is the most fun. It is the most fun because you get to shout, you get to scream, you get to upset people, you get to go ahead, break new ground, go into new territories, challenge new archetypes, challenge denominations. And for anybody who's called to that mandate, it can be a lot of fun, right? Okay, it's only fun if you're there. If you're called to be there, the rest of us are like, 
Why? I just wanted a nice afternoon tea. We were going to sit down with the leaders. We were going to fellowship in the Lord and have a nice time. But you invited a Joshua. What did you expect? The fire was going to come with their hard edge and sword that had been sharpened over years and years of usage. (laughs) But we need each other. We need each other. And you can't be a Moses and a Joshua at the same time. You can move from one to the other. And I started out as a Joshua, actually. I broke the ground when the ministry first started. Craig and I were both the Joshuas together, side by side. And when the opportunity came, we were the first ones to go to Europe. We went where angels feared to trade. We didn't even know half the people there. We were the first to go and start the works and get the people challenged and get them all inspired and try and train. If I, if I look back, sometimes, to be honest, I'm a little bit embarrassed <laughs> because I had like this much zeal and this much wisdom and about this much knowledge at the time. We were very young. We were very ambitious. We were going to change the world tomorrow. We were Joshua's, and that is the nature of it. We did spiritual warfare. We went from region to region, declaring and decreeing and releasing stuff in the spirit. We were upsetting people, and we were having the time of our lives. So I said, it's the most fun. Tough, but the most fun. And when um, my father handed the ministry over to Craig and I, I was so ready to be Joshua again because I was so used to going ahead. I always broke new ground and then he would follow after, you know, fill the teaching and whatnot. And God said, yeah, that, that's great. You know, you've got to be Moses now. That means I've got to stand on top of the mountain, Lord. Yes, like this, Colette. Just like this. And someone else is going to do the fighting now. You can shift mandates, but it meant a character change for me. It meant that I had to go through a bit of a process. And when God has had you in one, he will take you through a transitional season to move on to the next. Because you've got to finish the one first before you can go on to the next. And you've got to make sure you complete that mandate. And I did complete that mandate. And actually, when I look back today, I look and see exactly what that accomplished. Because now we have ministry centers in all those places through the years. God actually used those seeds that we sowed back then. The ground that we broke back then, we're now building on. We need each one of these mandates in the church today. And then we have our fourth mandate, who I like to call the trainers. Our New Testament examples. I've got Jesus here, although to be really honest with you, I could have put Jesus on every single one of these, but I just really loved how he worked with the 12 disciples specifically, so I wanted to focus on that. Of course, Paul again, he was another one that was a trainer. He shifted to, um, and if you look at actually all the disciples, I mean, I could have put others on there too. You can see how they moved from one to the other as well as they got more mature, as they got more wisdom, and the Lord trained them further. And... um, What I have here is Acts 19, verse 9. But when some were hardened and didn't believe, but spoke evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and withdrew the disciples, reasoning daily in the school of Tyrannus. And you look how he continued there for two years. I see such a sudden shift in Paul's ministry. He now sits and he trains for a couple of years. And isn't that what Jesus did as well with his 12 disciples? He took three years to train them. And I love the example of our Old Testament type who is, come on, David. What a fantastic example of a trainer taking those mighty warriors, getting their strengths, banding them together, making them a unique and powerful force for the kingdom of Israel. He is a trainer of mighty men. He trains up leaders and believers to do good works of every kind. Now, I want you to understand something. He's not just a teacher. He's a trainer, an equipper. Another action word. Moses, although a pattern maker, actually is also a really good teacher, spiritual father, teacher. And you will notice how each one of these apostolic um, mandates include a bit of all of the fivefold ministry, either more of a teaching orientation or an evangelistic or a prophetic. But I'm going way beyond that. I'm looking at your commission as a whole. How you fulfill your commission will differ from apostle to apostle. 
but I'm looking at this commission that God has given each of us to fulfill. And David is a fantastic picture of a trainer. He banded the mighty men together. And look at Paul. He trained up the elders, the apostles, those spiritual sons he worked with. He didn't just parent them. He trained them to do the job that he could leave them behind or send them ahead to handle it. And if you've got a heart to equip, and you're going to find these guys starting prophetic schools, not just Bible schools. We're talking about people that are training up intercessors, teaching them hands-on. Come on, let me teach you how to pray. Let me teach you how to evangelize. Let me, let me show you. Come, come on the streets with me. Let's evangelize together. This is somebody who's a trainer, an equipper, not just a teacher. Yes, teaching will be involved. You can't train without doing some teaching. But your main focus is, it's again, a doing word. Let's do the job. And let me show you how to do the job. And when you're a trainer... You are very focused in what you do. In that when you're working with someone, you're always going to see the flaws. I know that I'm um, dealing with the trainer when all they see is what needs to change. Well, of course. They're like a coach, a personal life coach that says, if you want to be a success, we need to deal with that. Let's change that haircut. Let's change that attitude. Let's work on this character of yours and let's make you successful. That's what a trainer does, pushes you to your limit so that the potential in you can come out. Now, there are apostles who have just this passion. And you know, we get so much pressure from those around us, fellow leaders, those who follow us, other people in the church, to conform to what everybody else is doing. Well, that's not the way you're meant to be doing it. How can you be a trainer? You need to be a teacher. You need to have a Bible school. You need to start with the basics. And you can come under so much condemnation because you keep doing things so differently. But guys, you're an apostle. You're meant to be doing things differently. It is part and parcel of the call. It is our difference that unites us. It is our diversity that makes us strong. God has put us in these positions for a reason. If you conform yourself to someone or something else, you're not going to be effective in the mandate God's called you to do. You're going to have one foot in one mandate and another foot in someone else's mandate. And you're not going to move forward or backwards. You're going to be stuck in the mud going nowhere fast. If you want to move forward, you need to focus on the mandate God has given you. And if you've been called to be a trainer, it is one of the most difficult mandates that there is. And it is a thankless, thankless job. And let me tell you, it's a calling. Because no one else can handle that much rebuff, rejection, failure, people bailing out on them without it being a call. You know, I look at what so many of my team go through as trainers in our ministry, <laughs> the hours, the days, the years they travail with each one of their students, their disciples, they cry over them, they pray over them, they work day and night with them. For many of them, when the going gets tough to them to turn around and say, I'm done, I can't do this, I'm out of here. I, I, nah, I, I don't need to take that from you. I don't need that correction. I don't need to hear that I need to deal with my sin. I don't have any sin. I don't need to deal with that. Do you know how much courage it takes to get into someone's face and say, you are full of bitterness and pride, die already? Do you know how much courage that takes when you know the rebuff that you're going to get? No, sorry, that word is a um, spirit of divination. You're in complete deception and you're demonized and you need to deal with that. People love hearing that, like all the time. All the time, they love it when you tell them that. It's their favorite thing to hear. But it's unavoidable when you're you know, kind of training prophets who thought that they would go looking for the Spirit of God in places where they should never have gone looking and activating certain things in their spirit that really didn't need no activating at all and weren't exactly activated by the Holy Spirit either, you know what I'm saying? That were born with generational bondages and divinations and then try and bring that into the prophetic ministry. You know what I'm talking about. We see this rampant in the church. And why is it rampant in the church? Because no one has the courage to get in their faces and say, that is a demon. But a trainer does. The trainer does. And they're prepared for the backlash. It doesn't mean it's easy. Of course it's not easy. Who likes to be spewed at? 
Who likes to be told that you're just being a dominating so-and-so trying to push your agenda on them and they don't know anything and what price they've paid to get this? And what would they be without this? You, you don't want that. But when you're a trainer, you've got the courage for that. You've got the courage to get up again and again and face it again and again. And I tell you what, I take my hat off to those in my team that are such trainers because they take more rebuff more backlashes, more bitter words as these students are going through their training. You know, <laughs> tomorrow we have our graduation. Each one of us will cry because we know the journey that each one of you have gone on. But when I sit there and cry, and I do every graduation, I try not to, but I do. I cry for my trainers because I remember the price they paid to get you there. I remember sitting around that dinner table talking about each one of you and how they wonder if you're gonna make it through. I remember sitting and praying them through when they were crying on my shoulder saying, I've obviously failed, I'm the worst trainer ever. What have I done wrong? What do I need to do? Where should I go next? That's what I remember when each one of you stand up there on that stage. I look at the price that each one of these guys prayed, paid and prayed to put you there. Now that's the heart of a trainer. And when you have that heart, only the Holy Spirit could have put it there because no one could take that much punishment just for the fun of it. And we need more Davids in the church who have the courage to go through with God's people. Look, we've even got some who've got the boldness to get in your face and say you've got a demon. But how many have the courage to then take you by the scruff of your neck and deal with it until the demon's gone? To deal with your spewing and your bitterness and your garbage until the demon's gone. How many people have the courage to go through after they've made you manifest? Hmm? Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. And that's why we need more trainers in the body of Christ. And if you are a trainer, then please stop trying to be a pattern maker. Police trainers are like the worst pattern makers because their pattern is all about change this, change this, change this, change this, change this, die already, change this, change this. It's like, what are we going to build? You're always spending the time tearing things down. <laughs> terrible pattern makers, terrible, terrible. And pattern makers make the worst trainers too because they now let's structure it so make sure that this doesn't happen again. It's like, I haven't got time to figure that out. We've got a demon to deal with here. We've got a life to change. We've got some equipping to do. Each one of us has a place. Find your place and recognize this is a mandate from the Father, an honor, a privilege. You're looking for a position and a title. Here it is right here, bundled in with the price that you're called to pay for it. We have the fifth mandate. I like to call these apostles the builders. I think the builders probably have the best work satisfaction because they get to see the finished product. They, the Solomon, as you can imagine, and James, Jesus' brother, James, the apostle in Jerusalem. I love the book of James. A lot of people don't understand the book of James, but I get James because this was his mandate. He was a builder. You see, You've got Paul and Peter. You've got Peter with his big mouth breaking ground there. You've got Paul getting his patterns and laying out the structure. And even if you look at all the patterns that Paul set for the New Testament church, I mean, where would we even be as a body without that pattern, right? I mean, he set us up on how we should be prophesying, the gifts of the Spirit, the hierarchy of the fivefold ministry. I mean, he laid every, every pattern for, for marriage and Christianity, for so many different aspects of our Christian walk. We really needed it. But then there was someone that had to make it happen. You know, it's one thing having a pattern, but then you need somebody to live with it. You know, Paul did so much moving around, and we look maybe two years here, maybe three years there. But for the most part, he did a circuit, and he was always moving around. Listen, how can you build when you never stay in one place long enough to build? I mean, look at David. Same thing, right? He was all over the place. He was always going out for war. And even when he stayed home, well, we know how that went for him, right? <laughs> Not good to leave a David at home. He gets up to way too much hanky-panky. Send the man out to war. Please. Then again, I'm not so sure Solomon was any better, but at least he, he kept to his own, right? 
<laughs> mm. He certainly knew how to make Abel the sun shone. Anyway, your builders are James and Solomon. 1 Chronicles 22 verse 10. And he shall build a house for my name. He's speaking of Solomon now. And he shall be my son. And I will be his father. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom of Israel forever. And I love as well this illustration of James. We look at Galatians 2.9, and this is a writing of Paul. But Paul is explaining what happened when he'd been running the race a little bit. And he'd been sent to the Gentiles. He's getting all these patterns. And then he thought, you know what? Maybe I should go hang out with some of the other apostles to find out if this race has been in vain. I mean, I'm pretty sure I'm on track, but let me go see if I'm really on track. And who does he go and visit? In Galatians 2.9, and when James... Cephas and John, Cephas being Peter, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. James stayed at home to build. He built the church at Jerusalem. He paid his life for the church at Jerusalem. And it became this hub where even those from the center in Antioch visited to make sure that they were still on track. Sure, there were some things about James. He was a good Jew. There came some conflicts in some of the building later on between how Antioch was built and how Jerusalem was built. But still, I love the illustration of James. And when you read the book of James, it just, I could just put the whole book of James there. You get the man. Guys, this is how you're behaving in your fellowship. You know, you guys are acting like a bunch of children. You're busy striving. I love James 4, my famous cha favorite chapter in the whole of the book of James. You know, you're striving for your pleasures. You're bickering amongst one another. You're striving here and there. I'm like, James, were you just at one of the church meetings down the road the other night? Where is the striving and conflict coming from among you? Your desires for pleasure that strive within your members. You lust and do not obtain. You murder and covet. You do not have. You do not have because you don't ask. And when you ask, you ask amiss just for your own pleasures. Yeah, I could have preached that last week, right? Last Sunday. This is a man who knew what it was like to live at local church every single day. He was a pastor's pastor's pastor. He lived with the people every day. He didn't just talk about patterns. He lived the patterns and made those patterns very, very practical for the people to follow. And if you're called to be a James or a Solomon, you're called to build. And guess what? You're called to stay at home. You see, I, was, I know an apostle is one who was sent. And certainly James was sent. He was commissioned by Jesus himself. But we always think that that means leaving country. Remember, like I said, for the spiritual parent, we think that that means leaving country, leaving family. But it wasn't so with James. James stayed at home. He stayed and took care of business. He built up and established the work right there. And if you just stop for a minute, you'll see that we already have a lot of Jameses in the, the body of Christ right now. We love to knock those bishops. I am first in line, really. Have you just not got the courage to call yourself an apostle? Really? Yeah. You think that wearing a collar and calling yourself a bishop, you kind of like don't have the courage to really say I'm an apostle, but if I'm a bishop, it's a little bit more like a foot in the door. Hmm? It's just a James. There's nothing wrong with that. We need them. We need those who stay at home to build. Not everybody can go out. Who's going to stay at home in Jerusalem? Who's going to be the covering or that place of warmth where the rest of the apostles who have been going out need to come and find shelter? Because actually, Peter was one of the elders in the church in Jerusalem. But he was never at home, see? Because Peter, he was out there blazing trails everywhere he went. He was always breaking ground and going out and healing the sick and sending out the gospel and going and doing and fighting. But then he needed to come home every now and again to a place of refuge. He came home to Jerusalem. Do you know what? That's where James were keeping the campfires burning. Mm -hmm. We need the Jameses who will build the pattern, who will establish it and cause a place of comfort, a place where people can belong. 
And if God keeps grounding you and not letting you go out, but keeps telling you to build, then maybe you're a Solomon. Maybe you're a James and you're meant to be hands-on. You're practical and you're going to teach. You're going to instruct and you're going to get involved day by day. It's not for everyone. And if you're not a Solomon, if you're not a James, don't feel guilty because you're not a James. You're not meant to. But because I think this is probably the most common apostolic type that we see in the church right now, everybody thinks that that's what it should be. You know, I consider Jesus. So what church did he build? Where were his steeples? Yeah, where was his congregation? I didn't see a building. I didn't see a big church that he established by the time he had died, but yet he started a movement that we're still in today. Amen. Hmm? Not all of us can be a James. Some of us have to go out. And just because you haven't built a big church doesn't mean you're not an apostle. It means you're just not a James. And perhaps you're not meant to be. But if you are, then it's time for you to begin to build, to take the pattern and to establish it. Now, that you may not receive the pattern, but you sure know how to take the pattern and know what it's meant to look like. Look at Solomon. He didn't get the pattern. But I tell you what, what he did with that pattern, he made it shine. He rocked that pattern. And I love that because even in our ministry, me being the pattern maker, I think that I've got it all together. And I say, this is how we're going to do it. And then one of the Solomons in my team get a hold of that pattern and they put bling all over it. They just bling it and they just make it all extravagant. They're builders. It's what they do. They're like, ooh, I'm going to bedazzle this pattern. Check this out. And that's what they're meant to do. They make it look good. Solomon didn't just build the temple. He built so much more than that. He built his palace. He built cities. And he took the land by building on it. You see, David also took the land, but he took it with the tip of a sword. Solomon took the land, but in a very different way. He did it by building on it and establishing in it and making sure that they couldn't be rooted up from it very quickly. Then we have our last apostolic type. And I like to call these guys the finishers. A New Testament example is Timothy, and our Old Testament type is Aaron. 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Numbers 3, verse 8. Also they shall attend to all the furnishings of the tabernacle of meeting and to the needs of the children of Israel and to do the works of the tabernacle. And you shall give the Levites to Aaron and his sons. They are given entirely to him from among the children of Israel. Moses got the, the picture. He got the pattern. You have Paul who got the pattern. But I love 1 Corinthians 4.17 where it says, this is my son. He will remind you of my ways in Christ. And when Paul is sent to be beheaded, Timothy is still finishing the work that Paul started. Just like Aaron took the pattern that Moses had begun and from generation to generation to generation continued the work. Even long after the tabernacle had been exchanged for a temple, we still see Aaron and his sons continuing the work, working side by side with Moses. And Aaron is one that may not get the pattern, but he is certainly the one that sees it to the end and continues it. He is the finisher, the one that makes sure that the job gets done. Very pastoral, very hands-on, the heart for the people. He gets involved. He takes the pattern that's been given to him, and he makes sure that it's finished to the end, that the light fittings are on, that the finishing touches are on. He doesn't just build. He completes the building completely. Now, this takes a lot of pressure off you if you're called to be an Aaron or a Timothy. You don't have to be the trailblazer. You don't have to get the pattern. 
You don't have to even be a spiritual parent. You just have to make sure the job gets finished. Is the mandate completed? And there are some people, I'm sure you even know, who walk in that anointing. They're finishers. You get your starters and you get your finishers. Your Timothy and your Aaron, they have a patience to see it through to the end. I am not one of those people. At one time, yes, but that time is gone. I am not that person anymore. I am the one that gets the pattern and then hands it out to the builders so that they might build it, who then work with the finishers who see it through to the end. What an incredible team we are working together, hand in hand. Can you see how the apostles can work together? Some are going to blaze a trail. Some are going to build the church. Some are going to get the pattern. But together, we can establish the kingdom of God. I wrote here, one sows, another waters. Isn't that what Apostle Paul was talking about? Hmm? One lays a foundation, another builds on it. One gets a pattern, the next breaks ground, the next builds, the next maintains, the next equips and trains for function within it. Each one of us has our place, has our part to play. And we can work together to do it if we've got some humility, if we're prepared to let the me, myself, and I aside and just do what God has called us to do. Now, in all of these six types mandates, if you will, that I've mentioned to you, there are functions. And I know we're going on with time, but I've got nine very specific functions that re regardless of what your mandate is. See, because I've given you your job. What are you? Are you a builder? Are you a finisher? Are you a trainer? Are you a pattern maker? What are you? Now, how do you know if you're doing your job. You know what your job is now. How do you know if you're doing your job? And these are just nine points for now. I hope you're going to add to these. Please, can I challenge you? Don't be like baby birds. Fly like eagles for yourselves and get your own revelation, please. You're all familiar with Ephesians 4, 11, 12, and 13. He gave some apostles, prophets, so on and so forth. You know it. For the equipping of the saints, the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Nine functions, and here they are. Function number one, to receive a mandate and to implement it. 1 Timothy 3.10 but you have carefully followed my doctrine. This is Paul speaking. Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance. The commission. How can you even fulfill your mandate? You don't know what it is. So let's start with step number one. Get a mandate. Or should I rather say recognize your mandate because you can't go get a mandate because God gives a mandate. Like I said with the vision, you can't just catch it like, yeah, let me just throw a mandate at you. Just catch it. You can't do that. You receive one from the Holy Spirit. So number one, recognize your mandate and begin implementing it, okay? Number two, equip the leaders within that mandate. All right, so you know what you are. You're a builder, pattern maker, now, obviously, with this mandate in place, God's already brought those to you that share this, that share aspects, visions within that mandate, right? Are you equipping them for it? Or are you just worried about yourself? Because I see in 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, Paul says to him, I charge you therefore. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead and his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. He is instructing Timothy. You see, he didn't just give Timothy the pattern. He trained him in it. He equipped him in the pattern. Don't just throw a pattern at someone and that they suddenly know how to build it or finish it or do anything with it. 
Paul laid it out very clearly. Have you equipped the leaders? You know, David positioned his mighty men. Moses imparted the anointing that was on him to the 70 elders. Paul raised up Timothy and Silas. So you've got a mandate. Big deal. Who's running with you? Have you taken time to raise up those that are going to fulfill it with you? Number three, if you're an apostle, there's another proof of the function that you should be fulfilling in the church. You have established a structure. You call yourself an apostle. Number one, I want to know what your mandate is. Number two, I want to see the fruit of that in those that you've raised up in it. And number three, show me your structure. 2 Timothy 1.13, hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me. 1 Corinthians 14.39, therefore brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. And I love verse 40, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. You see, he didn't just teach them about the spiritual gifts, he brought structure. Moses gave structure. Paul gave structure. James gave structure. Even David, who was a trainer, had structure. What does your structure look like? Organization. Hey, I know you prophets hate it. But it's not a prophetic seminar now, is it? It's an apostolic one. Tell me, apostle, what does your structure look like? Number four. You guys should be familiar with this phrase, to drive the vision forward. I love this scripture that epitomizes this concept of driving the vision forward. Romans 3.13. Brethren, I do not consider myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Jesus Christ. I see Paul running a race saying, I forget those things that are behind and I continue to press forward. I drive the vision forward. I forget those things that are behind me. They're past, they're over, they're done. What's the next vision? An apostle is one that drives the vision forward forward. He is one that takes the church through transition, allows it to evolve. You've got Joshua who took the children of Israel from the wilderness to the promised land. You've got David who took the children of Israel from a divided kingdom to a united kingdom. You have Paul who took them from the Old Testament into the New Testament. The apostle is one that takes the church through transition because they're driving the vision forward and continue to get revelation. You see, you can't just rip the old way away from them. You can't just take away the old vision. You've got to drive a vision forward and help the church transition into it. If you're an apostle, what? are you transitioning the church into? You see, even if you're a pattern maker, that means that you're displacing an old pattern. If you are a trainer, that means that you're teaching them a new way of doing things, right? If you're blazing a trail, of course, you're completely challenging old mindsets, status quo, doctrines, religion, archetypes. You know there's a displacement going on. You're driving it forward. What are you doing to transition the church from the old to the new. You can't just wait for God to do it all by himself. God chose you. You've got to step forward and fulfill your function. Drive the vision forward. Number five, an apostle isn't just one that starts a ministry. I left that out of my list completely because that's in the signs of the character of apostle. I'm going deeper. An apostle is one that creates a place for ministry. Until Jesus had come along, there's no such thing as apostles. Until David come along, there weren't 24-hour praise and worshipers. There were no mighty men. And certainly the prophet didn't have a place in court. He created a position for the seer. He created a, p a position for the worshipers. Moses created a position for the 70 elders. He made something that wasn't there before. 
We spoke about raising up the mighty men. It's not good enough to just raise up mighty men. Are you giving them a place to function in once they raised up? Now, that's an apostle. An apostle looks and says, you don't have a place. Let's make you a custom fit place for your call. Holy Spirit, what do I do? Guess what happens when you do that, apostle? Your work grows. You multiply. You don't have five mighty warriors all doing the same thing in the same position and wondering why you're not getting anywhere. No. You have five mighty warriors that you create a place for so that they can function in their unique calling. I was so focused on the prophetic school at one time because that was the birth of my ministry. It was what I started with. And when God um, started calling me to be a Moses, he said, your thinking is about to shift in a very big way because I'm bringing you people with callings that you didn't even know were callings. They can have a heart to do things that you don't even consider ministry, but they are ministries and I have called them to do it and you better find a place for them. They're going to have a heart for the lost. They're going to have a heart for the elderly. They're going to have a heart to pray. They're going to have all these diverse desires. And he said, don't you dare send them away. But instead, you create a place for them in your ministry. You establish a department just for them so that they can flourish in it. We're not seeing this in the church and we're not seeing this in the apostolic ministry, but we need to see it more. Because we're too stuck in this is a calling and these are the only positions we have available in the church. We need to identify the potential in the mighty warriors and then create a place for them to function to the fullest of their potential. That is a sign of an apostle. Not one that talks about positions, but one that creates and custom fits a position to a mighty warrior. Number six, the apostle is one who appoints people to their place. Titus 1 verse 5. For this reason I left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I commanded you. The apostle is one that should be appointing people to position, not just himself. Please, Lord, we got it. You're the apostle. You're the bishop. You're the, the, the senior pastor. We got what you are. What's everyone else? Servants and shepherds and sheep, I don't know. Can we start appointing others to do the job? Can we start appointing other apostles? And there are some who are doing it. So I'm not going to knock all the apostles out there, just the ones that stand on their little tower and try and keep all the glory for themselves. Not too fond of those. Because a huge part of our function is to appoint. And you know, God will send Craig and I sometimes into the most obscure places just to go and appoint someone to put them in an office and leave again. Just that, just that one thing. You'll send us into the middle of nowhere to a little church, a little meeting, just a little sidetrack to go and pick up a mighty warrior or to go and appoint someone into an apostolic office or prophetic office and that's all he had us travel halfway around the world to do. Happened to us many, many times because the Lord needs his apostles to lay hands and impart and release and place people in that office. And not a lot of them are doing it. They're ordaining because, well, you've been faithful to this ministry for a long time. And you went through our Bible school course. So we can, we've decided we're going to ordain you to be an apostle because you look very apostolic right now. <sighs> really? Really? Should we ask God the Father what he wants? What's this apostle's mandate? What is their structure? Where is their team? And they don't need you to qualify them. The Father qualifies them. You just need to put the cherry on the top, lay your hands, release the power, and walk away. They're an apostle. They'll get the rest of this just fine. Amen. Walk next to an apostle, not over him. He should be fulfilling this. If they're not fulfilling this, they're not apostles. They're just lackeys, but you gave them the title apostles, so they'll stay in your ministry. That's not what I'm talking about, okay? That's not the function I'm talking about when I say appoint them to their place. I'm talking about releasing, decreeing, imparting, giving them the anointing and power and confirming for them what God's already told them and then sending them and letting the Holy Spirit send them out. Now, there may be some that, can, that will stay and walk alongside you, and I've got a few of those. But for a most apostles that I've ordained 
and released into apostolic office. They went out to be apostles. How about that? They went out to do their mandate and their work in their realm. And that was the point. Not for them to stay under me. I didn't appoint them. God appointed them. And we need to see a little bit more of this in the body of Christ. Seven, to impart. I already mentioned this. To impart. So not just appoint, but impart the power of God to others. Romans 1.11. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift so that you may be established. The apostle, because of the nature of his training and the journey, has gone through a refining process. His vessel has been stretched from here to kingdom come, and as a result, has accumulated the authority, the power, the anointing to do the work that God's called him to do. Now, what I love about it is that we went through all of that, not to hold on to it, but to impart it to others so that they could eat the fruit of our labor, to let them take the shortcut. They don't have to go through that whole process that we went through. The apostle is meant to impart the gifts. And I love doing that. It's my most favorite thing to do. And for any of you that have been through our schools, I didn't even need to lay hands on you. And how about that gift of discerning your spirits, right? <laughs> God does not mess around with that gift of discerning your spirits, right? Those of you that, that's probably one of the, uh, the one gifts that I flow in the strongest. So everybody always picks that up. You won't believe how many people got spirit-filled and start speaking in tongues after going through some of our courses, just that impartation, it establishes them in their calling. And you know, I don't doubt they could get it from the Lord themselves on their own. Of course they could. But it's nice to have a shortcut. And that's what the apostles there. You went through the long journey so that others wouldn't have to. An apostle is meant to be imparting and releasing. And maybe they're meant to stay, maybe they're not. But let's please impart the gifts and impart the anointing that God's people need to overcome the problems in their life and also to be established to do the work of God that he's called them to do. Number eight, to reveal the fullness of God to his people. Hmm. I speak about the prophet. You guys, you, prof you prophets that are here, I speak how the prophet reveals Jesus to his people how you bring the bride into reality of a face-to-face -face relationship with Jesus. Now, the apostle is meant to do the same thing. However, he's meant to bring a reality of the fullness of the Trinity to the church, to experience the fear, the righteous fear of the Father, the tender love and embrace of Jesus and the fire, and the signs and wonders of the Holy Spirit. That is why your training has been what it is. To reveal to the church the fullness of the Father, of the Spirit, and of the Son. Depending on where that person is right now, where they are, you should be able to express the nature of God that needs to be expressed to that specific person. That is why you've gone through what you have. Why one minute you were trembling before the Father, the next minute you just had this righteousness of the Holy Spirit, and the next you felt the tender, sweet love of Jesus, and you're thinking, am I going psycho? <laughs> what is it exactly, Father? Who are you? I am all. I am one and three, three and one. Don't you understand? It is part of the apostolic call so that whoever comes, you know, sometimes when somebody comes to us for ministry, they need Jesus right now. They need a lover and a groom who says, I love you, and you're broken, and you're hurt, and come and rest in my arms and let me heal you. They need that. But then there are other times when somebody needs a sign and a wonder and a conviction of sin. And there's times when they need the righteousness of the Father to bring them to their knees and says, who are you to tell God how he should use you? He is God. He is your Father. You reverence Him. Depends what they need. You, as an apostle, should be able to reflect every aspect of the nature of God to His people because you know God in His fullness. And I'm going to end with the scripture that epitomizes that beautifully in a little bit, but I just want to mention 
the ninth function of the apostle, and that is to establish a work that remains. Tell me, apostle, what is the seal of your apostleship? Because in 1 Corinthians 9, 2, Paul said, if I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. An apostle is one who has built a structure that remains for generation after generation. Whether you're a trailblazer or a builder, it doesn't matter what your mandate is. Whatever you have done should remain. And isn't that our goal as apostles? You don't want to think that when all is said and done, the winds and the waves will come and just wash away the work you've done like sandcastles on a beach. You would like to imagine that you've raised up your team, that you've imparted everything that you have, that you've positioned them so that that work may remain. 2 Corinthians 2.15 For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are aroma of death leading to death. And to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? For we are not, as so many, peddling the word of God. <laughs> yeah, he had them in those days too, those who peddled the word of God for their own gain. It's been, it's been a thorn in the side of the body of Christ for years now. But as of sincerity, but as from God, we speak in the sight of God in Christ. Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or do we need, as some others, epistles of condemnation to you or letters of con commendation from you? Sorry, not condemnation, commendation. Do we need commendation? Sorry, I'm an apostle. Do I need commendation to you so that I can prove to you that I'm an apostle? Do I? Do I need commendation from you? Do I need you to even say, oh yes, you're an apostle to know who I am? <laughs> you, he says to the Corinthians, you are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Do I need a degree? Do I need commendation of men? Do I need a, certif a certificate that says, you are an apostle? Do I even need someone to say, oh, I can see that you are an apostle? No. But let us say today, as Apostle Paul said, you are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read by all men. Clearly, you are an epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but by the Spirit of the living God, and not on tablets of stone, but in tablets of flesh, that is, of the heart. And we have such trust with Christ toward God, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as being from ourselves, <laughs> but our sufficiency is from God, who made us sufficient as ministers of this new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit brings life. Apostle, when all is said and done, and you've gone through your list, and you have confirmed your apostolic call, and you know what your mandate is, and you're running this race, on whose heart have you written? I don't care how many books are under your belt. I don't care how many churches you have built, how many ministries you have established. Tell me, who is the seal of your apostleship? Who? Who? Not what. Who is the seal of your apostleship? What have you left in the wake of this mandate of yours? Another structure of men to be torn down again tomorrow? Or have you birthed 
in the spirit of those God has brought you, this mandate he's given to you? Does it matter so much to you to be called an apostle and recognized as an apostle or to be an apostle? Because I know the proof of my apostleship. They're in my spiritual children. They're in my team, my mighty warriors. They're in those that I give my life for and invest and see them rise up and do better than me. And I don't care if I have the title and I don't care if somebody says, so you think you're an apostle? I'm like, (laughs) really? Really? Are we going to fight about this title, are we? Because the title isn't something you wear. It's something you do. It's something you die for. It's something you impart. And if we could just allow the spirit to bring life instead of the letter to kill, perhaps, just perhaps, we'll start a movement. Perhaps we'll begin something in this generation that will continue for the generations to come because it's not all about what we've done or what we've built, but who we've established and who we've raised up. When all is said and done, one day, Can I look as Christ looked when he hung on the cross and see his inheritance? Do you see your inheritance today? Do you look down and say the price is worth it because I see the inheritance in the faces of every single person that I've imparted to and raised up. And even if no one knew my name, I know that some fruit remains and it is good fruit. That is why we do what we do. That is why we die when we die. That is why we push through when we've got no more strength to push through. Because it's not about the me, myself, my I, the functions, the mandates, the apostles, the the types. Those are all very interesting. They're all very fascinating. I love to talk about and I love to teach about it. But you know what I love more than all of that? is to see the mighty warriors rise up and take their place and shake the gates of hell and to set the captives free. That's really what I love, and that's why we do what we do. I thank you, Holy Spirit. I thank you for your conviction. I thank you for your fire. And, Father, I thank you for your presence right now. Lord, lay the weight of this church on our shoulders. Bring us to remembrance why you came in the first place to set us free. Let us remember the child you called to do the impossible, to be the impossible. Let us throw aside every weight, every title, every accomplishment to just be clay in your hands again, Lord, to get back to the joy, the joy of why we started this road. And above all, Lord, let us set your your church as a city on a hill, whatever part that means to play. Let us run this race and reach our goal together. In Jesus' name, amen. Hmm, Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. The Holy Spirit is certainly challenged. Is there something you want to share now? No. If any of the team has something to share, if you're somebody of the team has something to share, come up. Don't make me call you. (laughs) I feel the Holy Spirit's not done yet. The Lord's breaking down some old walls, some old misconceptions. There's been so many um, insecurities that you've had that you've tried to cover over and build with all these walls and the Holy Spirit's busy tearing them down. He's trying to bring you back to the basics of ministry and what it's all about. Allow him to do the work. Allow him to breathe on those seeds that I spoke about. Let's be the children again we once were. Naive. Silly. That it wasn't about your way or my way. It was just about doing something, anything for him. Just because it felt so good. It just felt so good to just be used. 
felt so good to flow in the anointing. Remember how simple it was. <laughs> you just felt so good to give that prophetic word because you just felt God all over you. Remember that? It wasn't about principles and rules. It's just the pure joy of doing his work, guys. Since when did we become so old? Huh? We get old and grumpy, hmm? <laughs> when did we lose it? Hello, there we go. I just love what Colette's sharing because as I'm sitting there, the Lord reminded me that 500 years ago, Luther went and posted on the church door a document that changed the way the church was ever going to be again. He, he, and he didn't do it because he wanted to do that. He just did it because he was tired of seeing something wrong. He took what God had put in him and he laid it out and he did something. He took action. And it wasn't even him that progressed it more. It was Gutenberg and all of those guys. He, Gutenberg who took the, the print, that, 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 those, those words and he put it on, a, on, on his printing press <laughs> and he duplicated it. But because Luther was there and he did that one action, the dominoes started to fall. That set in motion a movement that changed the church. Mm. 500 years ago. I think it's time we do another Luther, don't you guys? The church has come a far way. But it's a pretty sad state when the Christians don't even know the voice of their Jesus. It's a pretty sad state when we don't, many Christians don't know that can walk in victory. The good news is not just that you're going to go, you're not going to hell. The good news is that we have a partner that came into a blood covenant with us and gave us all the blessings in him and him Amen. And we need to walk in that. And this is the weight that I feel is so important, is that we need to take this. And whatever our Luther moment is, <laughs> let us do it. However silly it may be, the repercussions of that movement, that little motion, that little action, is what's going to spearhead the change that we're dying to change, see in this world. Mm. And we get to do it. We, we get to do it as a team. We get to do it as a family. And this is what I love that is so important to me, is that Luther had himself. But we have a whole family. Look at us. We get to do this together, guys. It changes. It changes everything. Because you're not alone. No. You're not going there and hoping that you're going to get it right. You've got those, like Colette said, you got the James to come and say, you're doing a good job. Don't worry about it. <laughs> when we're out there and it's, and it's getting a bit rough because the, the spears are more than the blessings. <laughs> we have the James in our lives that can say, keep it going. We're going to keep the prayers for you. We've got the prayer backing. We've got everything you need. Let's just carry on. Do what you're doing. We've got you back. And I think that's more important. Because when you're out there alone and you're all alone, it's a pretty scary place to be. But mm. just knowing that someone's got your back, just a phone call away, an email away, just anything you've got, we got, there's a backing there that gives you the strength to push on a little bit more. Amen. 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 I just had, was sitting there and I had one simple word from the Lord for each one of you. Now, having taken everything that's been taught, be bold. All the apostles in the old day, they made a difference and they made the change, not because of their great ideas or because of their great abilities, but because they were bold enough, silly enough, stupid enough 
to stand there and be the Lord's vessel, you see your insecurities and you see your flaws. You see where you've messed up and you see the trail and the, maybe the mess you've left behind. But dare you be bold enough to make even more of a mess? Dare you be bold enough to be even more of a fool for Christ? Because you're going to make a change. And it's because of your foolishness. It's because of your stupidity that we're going to make this change in the earth. So don't sit there in the quiet when you have a word to say. Don't hide away. Don't hide your light under a bushel, but shine it bright. It's because of that light. It's because of that fire that God has put in you that you're going to change the church. Yeah, sure, you're a wildfire, and maybe you upset some people, and you leave them away being a little bit scorned. So what? Better than be scorned and make a change in this earth. Then you hide away and let them walk in the darkness. Be bold. Maybe you'll get it wrong, but you know what? Because of that one wrongdoing you will make will change your life forever and be, may give you the opportunity to go and make a change and get things right. So don't hide. Don't be afraid to step out. Don't be afraid to maybe mess up with your team, to mess up with the structure, to mess up with whatever it is. Because you know what? Through your failure, through your mistakes, through your boldness, and your courage, being courageous for him, we're going to change and we're going to make a difference in this earth. Amen. Amen. I just send forth the shaking in the hearts of every single person that's here right now, Lord. <laughs> send forth that shaking right now. I send forth this shaking right now. And I shake everything that's in its place that does not need to be there until what remains is simply what you have for each and every one of your apostles here right now. And I send forth this boldness right now in the hearts of every person. And I cut every relationship that should not be right now. And I remove these people from their homes. I remove these apostles from their countries and from their homes. And I establish those that need to be established in these new cities, in these new families right now. I establish you in this family right now. And I bring forth those connections that you need. And I bring forth those relationships that you need right now. And I just uproot every mountain that stands in the way that you have tried so hard to uproot in your own power. And I pluck it up and I cast it into the sea. You be removed every last mountain that stands in the way. And I lay this carpet of favor before you that have struggled and travailed in your own strength. And I pick you up and I give you this position of honor that God has for you. For you do not have to struggle and fight for the position. But I give it to you, says the Lord. I give you this position of honor for the humility that you are willing to wear. I give you the seat on the throne. Broko miash katala manzolo bienza hi abrashe katai hi ambrokomia hi abrashete send forth a cloud by day and a fire by night i seal you with the protection of the father with angels of swords to protect you right now prepare the way before you now and i open up a door that no man can close <laughs> Not even you and your stupidity will shut this door, says the Lord. <laughs> it is time to walk boldly, says the Lord. It is time to not care about the limp that you have, but to trust in the power that I have given you. It is time to not care about what you can or cannot do, the ability you do or do not have. For I have the ability that you do not have. And the power that you need, I have for you. And I have given it to you. For you do not walk this road alone. But I stand beside you. I stand in front of you. And I stand behind you, says the Lord. Is it a kick you need? Then it is a kick you have today. It is, is it strength you need? 
then today I give you the biceps that you never had before. Is it vision you need? Then I open the eyes of the blind and I give those that cannot hear the hearing that they need. So do not care any longer for the journey that you must walk. Do not care anymore about the incapabilities that you have. But know today that I have set you on a new road and I will see it to the end, says the Lord. I just feel like there are some here who are waiting and stagnant and not moving forward. But I see how if you would just lift your flag high and you would just stand in your uniqueness, then those who belong to your tribe will come to you. You know, there's, being in such a big crowd so often, I realize something about being in a big crowd. It only takes one person to start moving. And if I just take that one step and start moving towards the car, I look behind me and the whole group starts moving with me. And that's all the Lord wants you to do. Just go. Just go. And they will follow. But they're waiting for a leader. They're waiting for somebody to make a move. Because while you're just standing there, People are conversating, they're talking about their life, their promotion, all the things they care about, what's for dinner, until somebody has the guts to stand up and go. I feel that some of you have compromised, you've let go of that, that, that thing that the Lord gave you, that uniqueness, that black and white that the Lord gave you. You know, Apostle Colette talked a lot about apostolic authority. That is what people makes people stick. And you keep being afraid to step out and move because you're afraid you're going to lose people. No, you're going to lose people if you don't step up, put your flag high because they don't see you. That's how you're going to lose people. Not by making a move, not making a move, but because you won't step up, wave your banner high. So they say, yes. That's what I'm looking for. I'm a soldier in the armies, in the Lord's army, and I'm looking for a general. But unless you stand up and be that general, how can you expect your army to recognize you and come to you? The Lord has risen up many mighty men, people. Stop looking so downtrodden and thinking, oh, where, when will they come? When? Who? Where are they? If you would just stand up and be seen, maybe they would start coming to you. So shake off the rejection. Shake off the hurts. Shake off your insecurities and just go. Go.